try. All right. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody, again. Um, are you hearing me okay? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, going to assume that everything is working unless somebody tells me otherwise, because uh, I'll, that way we can just keep moving forward. So it's really good to be with you. We actually have a little uh, contingent from our Havara in Albuquerque. I have my lovely wife, Jane, who's here. And I have my cousin, Errol, who is actually, he's part of our Havra in Albuquerque, but he's actually coming in from Astoria, Oregon. So uh, we all think it's great to be with all of you on this Shabbat. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I hope I've been around long enough to open with kind of a uh, personal question as we get into the uh, parasha in a little more depth. Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Are you a pessimist or are you an optimist? It's, it's really a relevant question today because uh, there are so many uncertainties, so many anxieties, dangers around us. And how do we look at it with optimism or with pessimism? And Rabbi Sachs, Jonathan Sachs of blessed memory in his uh, commentary on, there we go, his commentary on uh, this week's Padasha talks about optimism and pessimism. Is that coming through okay? Is my screen share working? All right. So he, Rabbi Sachs says, I prefer the word hope to optimism. Optimism is the belief that things will get better. Hope is the belief that together we can make things better. And uh, with all due respect, with my great respect for Rabbi Sachs, I'm going to embellish that a little bit. Hope is the belief that in God, together with God, in the divine human partnership that we see in Scripture, we can make things better. No Jew, knowing Jewish history, can be an optimist. But no Jew worthy of the name abandons hope. And again, I'll embellish a bit on uh, Rabbi Sachs. No Jew, knowing Jewish history, can be an optimist, but no Jew and no follower of the Jewish Messiah worthy of the name, abandons hope. So we can make things better in, in partnership with God. And this week's parasha, parashat <clears throat> Shalach Lecha, um, reveals a lot about the source of hope. I'm, I'm talking about keeping hope alive in an anxious time. Keeping hope alive in an anxious time. Let's see how this plays out in the parasha we have, last week we left um, Mount Sinai, headed toward the land of promise. We're in the wilderness of Paran on the outskirts of the promised land. <clears throat> and uh, the parasha opens with the Lord saying to Moses, Shalach lecha, send some men, uh, 12 men to scout out the land and uh, bring back a, a thorough report to the people. So one, one man from each tribe goes forth, is, is chosen, sent forth. They spend 40 days scouting out the promised land and come back with a report. And uh, 10 of the scouts start the report and they say, the land is indeed a good land. It's, it's, it really is flowing with milk and honey, um, but it's also got inhabitants. It's got mighty cities, fortress cities. It's got warriors. And there's some really big guys in this land. And they instill fear in the hearts of the um, Israelites. And the Israelites begin to, to rebel. And uh, Kalev, or Caleb, come, comes back with a positive report. He says we can take the land because God has promised it to us. So let's, let's look into the text. Uh, let's pick it up at Numbers 14.7. Uh, Kalev, Caleb joined by Joshua, they tear their garments when they hear the, the, the fearfulness of their people. And the people say, let's turn around, you know, let's go back. Uh, this is scary. We're terrified. Let's go back. Joshua and Caleb say the land that we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If Hashem delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. And by the way, that's, that's the hope 
that Rabbi Sachs was talking about. It's not optimism. It's not like, um, you know, let's close our eyes to the circumstances and just believe it's all going to work out fine. It's a divine human partnership. If, if Hashem delights in us, if we're walking with Hashem, if we're trusting in him, he will bring us into this land. We have hope. We know that it's um, fortified and filled with warriors, but if Hashem delights in us, he will bring us into this land. Only do not rebel against Hashem and do not fear the people of the land for they are bread for us. Do not fear the people of the land. Their protection is removed from them and Hashem is with us, do not fear them. And I kept the, this word, their protection, I kept the Hebrew there, tzilam, tzilam, their tzal, or tzalal, it's, it's literally, it's like a shadow. Their shadow has been taken from, a, from above them. And I agree with some of our sages who say that this is referring to um, demonic spiritual powers that the pagan nations are have like a covering, a prince in the terminology of the book of Daniel uh, over the nation that, that can spiritually oppose the purposes of God. In Daniel, uh, an archangel is sent to uh, co do combat with the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece, but their protection is removed from them uh, and Hashem is with us, and do not fear them, to go back a verse, so they're like bread to us. You know, 10 of the spies see these terrible, gigantic warriors, and Joshua and Caleb says, we can eat them up. So they're looking at this with, with hope informed by their connection to God. Do not fear, they say twice, um, but all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of Hashem appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. So anxiety, or excuse me, fear um, can be called in our more modern terminology, current terminology, anxiety. I think anxiety is like pervasive, long-term, chronic fear. And in contrast, Joshua and Caleb don't have fear, but they, have, they, they can see what's really going on spiritually. Because fear, one of the symptoms of, of fear um, is, is kind of a tunnel vision. You know, when our anxiety mounts, adrenaline pumps through our system, and uh, our, our vision narrows to just what's right in front of us. It's part of the fight or flight syndrome. We need to protect ourselves. Um, it's a good survival mechanism, but it's not a good basis to make a decision. So the fearful Israelites can't even see the, the underlying spiritual dimension that's going on here, that Joshua and Caleb can see there's a spiritual battle um, their protection, their covering is removed, and God is with us. A couple of other uh, symptoms of anxiety and fear that might sound kind of familiar these days. The, the solution that the uh, Israelites come up with to the um, positive report of Joshua and Caleb is, let's stone them with stones. You know, it's like, it's like quick fix thinking. They're scaring us. So let's eliminate them. It's a real symptom of uh, anxiety, a symptom of fear. It's not a good way to, to make decisions, is it? So it's scapegoating, quick fix thinking, let's stone them with stones. The, the scouts, the fearful scouts, the 10 scouts who are spreading this fear uh, resorted to another common symptom of anxiety, which is catastrophizing catastrophizing. Do you like that word? It's going to be on your spelling quiz tomorrow. Catastrophizing. It means, you know, looking at, at a problem as bad as it is and making it 10 times worse. Oy vey, this is horrendous. This is terrible. And the symptom of that is when they um, see the, the big guys 
in the land of Canaan or the promised land, it's more, it's beyond just Canaan, where they see the big guys there, um, they come back and they say, we saw the Nephilim. The Nephilim are introduced back in Genesis 6, right before the flood. And there are these mysterious, um, powerful, strange, monstrous, either humans or semi-human creatures that appear in this chaotic time right before the flood. And uh, the 10 spies are saying, we saw them again. We saw the Nephilim. That's in 1333. And uh, now and then I get asked the question, well, how did the Nephilim, because they come in before the flood, how did they survive the flood and get into the promised land um, when the, the, the whole rest of creation is flooded? Have you ever had that uh, question or heard that question? Um, and the answer is they didn't. They weren't really Nephilim. The, the, the 10 spies are exaggerating. They're, they're uh, catastrophizing. They're seeing something that isn't even there. And that's a, a symptom of their uh, fear and anxiety. And so final symptom, I already mentioned it, they have tunnel vision. Um, all they can see is what's scary in front of them, and they want to turn around and go back to Egypt, fight or flight. And Moses rises up to, uh, to intercede for them. The Lord says, you know, what's happening here is this, this is the, um, the glorious conclusion of the whole exodus. You've, got, you've gotten delivered from Egypt, you've come to Mount Sinai, you've gotten the Torah, and now you're going to go into the promised land. And at this point, the people refuse to go in and want to turn around. And uh, it's almost as if Hashem is fed up with them. I say almost as if because the Lord ultimately is always patient. But it looks like he's just had it with them. And Moses uh, rises up to defend or intercede for Israel. God says, I'm going to strike them with pestilence and, and, and disinherit them. I'm going to cut it off with them, and I'll make a new people of you, Moses. This is uh, the second time this has happened. The first time was with the golden calf. And Moses starts out in his prayer um, sounding almost like a PR consultant to, to Hashem. He says, you know, this is not going to look good. He's 21st century terminology. This, this would be bad optics, Lord. If you wipe everybody out, um, the people around us are going to say, you couldn't bring them in to the land. You, you failed. You couldn't do it, so you wiped them out. It's bad optics. He starts that way, but then he, Moses goes much deeper in his intercession before the Lord, and he draws uh, on who God is as the source of hope and uh, intercedes. Let's take a look at that again. So Moses, and by the way, Moses retains hope. Moses is not um, overcome by the fear, but he retains hope, and his hope is in what he's about to say. He says, and now please let the power of my Lord be great, as you have spoken, saying Hashem is slow to anger and abounding in kindness. And again, I preserved a little of the Hebrew here. Hashem is, is slow to anger, verav chesed, abounding in chesed, which is covenant, excuse me, loyalty, covenant faithfulness, uh, deep kindness. I love the old term loving kindness. I think that really captures chesed, but it's also loving kindness that is steady and unshakable. So Moses says, repeats back to God, you, Hashem is slow to anger and abounding in kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. And you will remember these are the words that the Lord used to describe himself back in Exodus 34 when Moses says, show me your glory. The Lord hides Moses uh, in a rock so that he can't see the Lord. But the Lord says, 
pronounces these, these qualities or these attributes of slow to anger, abounding in kindness and truth, forgiving iniquity, and so forth. And so Moses is, is interceding on the basis of God's own word, which is a very powerful way of prayer. It's a powerful way of instilling hope in ourselves and in those around us. And he says, please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your chesed. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your chesed, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Then Hashem said, I have pardoned according to your word. And if you know the whole story, you might be wondering, well, you know, the Lord says he's pardoned, but we know that the generation that uh, refused to go into the promised land still isn't going to go in. And we know that um, they're going to face the, the consequences of their unbelief. But God has pardoned them because the at stake here was that God uh, told Moses, I'm going to strike them with pestilence and disinherit them. They're no longer going to be my people. But because the Lord is rav chesed, is filled with chesed, with loving kindness, abounding and unchanging kindness and, uh, and mercy, um, the, the Lord will, will, go with, will go with them. He's not going to cut them off. He's not going to disinherit them, but, but the glory of the Lord is going to remain in their midst. And we'll see that as we go on through the uh, readings and numbers and beyond, that the glory of God is still with his people. They're still his people, and their next generation will inherit the land. On one level, that's not great comfort. The people are mourning but on another level, especially in the context of the um, very corporate mindset of the time, we're not going to get to go in, but our children and grandchildren will go in and inherit the land. And God's glory is going to be with us even in these 40 years of wandering. And all of that is because Hashem is, is Rav Chesed. He's abounding in unchanging kindness and, and loyalty as comes to full expression in the person of Messiah Yeshua. For the, Mo for the Torah came through Moses, John tells us, chesed ve'amet, grace and truth came through Yeshua HaMashiach. The ultimate source of, of hope, the ultimate counter to fear and pessimism is looking to the unchanging chesed of the God of Israel, the chesed that, that came was embodied and in our midst through Yeshua HaMashiach. So, by the way, if you say, uh, I'm not a, a pessimist, I'm a realist. You ever hear people say that? You know, are you an optimist or a pessimist? I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist. That means you're a pessimist. But the, but the source of our optimism is something greater than optimism. It is the hope we have in God's chesed as embodied in Messiah Yeshua. So fear narrows, limits vision, seeks quick fixes. Fear overlooks God's active intervention. And sometimes it's not that hard to overlook it. Sometimes God's intervention is, is mysterious. Sometimes it's long in coming, but fear forgets what God has done. Our our forefathers, you know, we came out of Egypt, we saw the miraculous deliverance, we saw the parting of the Red Sea, uh, we saw the, the presence of God upon Mount Sinai, but it was, when it was time to enter the promised land, we forgot all that and only through our tunnel vision of fear could see the threat before us. It's not a good way to make decisions. It's, it's inevitable that we'll have times um, when we face fearful circumstances, but don't give in to fear. Don't let fear control your response to what's going on out there, but, but keep hope alive by recalling, speaking out God's mercy. 
by the way, in prayer, Moses is, is repeating back to God what God said. He's, he's repeating scripture back to God. And I f- find that to be a very powerful practice in my own prayer life is praying scripture, speaking uh, scripture back to God. He's even kind of arguing with God based on, on scripture. And that's a powerful practice that we can uh, put into place ourselves. So hope expands vision, sees possibility. Hope relies on God for the big picture. And, and the big thing in the big picture that's going on is God's chesed. God has a purpose for our, our lives individually and as a people based on his loyalty, his loving kindness, his covenant faithfulness. So how to keep hope alive in an anxious time? Fear not, but remember and rely on God in Messiah, the glory of God, the presence of God, and God's chesed in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Thank you.